podcast where we talk about new and exciting technologies, professional development, clean code, career advancement, and more. I'm John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. Oh, and I'm Clayton. Man. <laughs> We're missing We're, our third. We, we have a third. <sighs> and I'm Clayton Hunt. With us today is Edward Thompson. Edward is a developer, tools nerd, maintainer of libgit2, the Git library, host of all things Git, the po- host of all things Git, the podcast about Git, and curator of Developer Tools Weekly. Welcome, Edward. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it doesn't help that I'm okay. Um, <laughs> I'm it's starting well. <laughs> Um, can you do it get, early? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before we get started with the meat of, of today's discussion, uh, why don't you tell us uh, kind of how you got into the industry and uh, got to the point where you are today? Yeah. Um, I fell into it in some sense. Um, I was really I was really fortunate. So, like growing up, I was interested in computers and and building software. Um, I ran a BBS when I was when I was a teenager, um, and so I I just kind of you know loved working on computers and and playing around writing little bits of software here and there to to just explore um, software development. Um, and as I was active in the like local BBS scene in the town I grew up in, um, I got to know other people who were into that scene, other programmers. And uh, I made a friend with another uh, high school student. Um, his name was Keith, Keith Wessel. And uh, Keith happened to have a job at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. So I grew up in, in this like small town in, in Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, which happens to have a world-class university, the University of Illinois at, at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, which happened to have a supercomputing center, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And I had a friend who had a job there. And so I, he, you know, he was writing software um, for a, a group called the Chemistry Visualization Group. Um, and I happened to talk my way into an internship there. And like, so at 14, I was playing with, uh, with supercomputers incredibly lucky just an incredibly fortunate series of events um and after that uh you know i i was able to just keep working um i i kept getting new jobs in uh in my hometown and eventually um you know one of the companies that i worked for like that was like a five person company in this cornfield uh in champaign illinois uh, got acquired by microsoft and uh, so after that, I've been at, at Microsoft most of the years since then. So for the last almost 10 years, I've been at Microsoft, except a little pivot to move off to a company called GitHub um, and then kind of back at Microsoft. So your, your early years or the, the movie War Games is loosely based on your life? Is that... <laughs> uh, I've been advised not to discuss that. <laughs> So you said you, you've been at Microsoft most of your years, but spend a, a good amount of time at GitHub as well. What, what was that like? Uh, so early on, so I've been at Microsoft a little over 10 years, I guess, uh, or I came to Microsoft a little over 10 years ago. Um, and that was, that was very different. Um, so I came in through this acquisition. We were a tiny little company. And if you're a tiny little company, building enterprise software, um, you, you've got to stretch a little bit. And the way we stretched was, of course, using a lot of open source components. We used a lot of libraries and, and toolkits that were open source. And uh, that, that made sense for us. You know, we were writing some Java application and we needed to do some logging. We're not going to invent yet another Java logging framework. We're just going to use one of the ones that already exists. So. Um, when Microsoft came and wanted to acquire us, one of the things that they do is they, they do due diligence. They look at the financials, make sure that's in order, and they look at the code to make sure that that's in order. And so they, they opened up our, our code and what they wanted to do was make sure that, first of all, that it wasn't just a pile of you know garbage, but also to make sure that we held all the copyrights. 
to all the code that we had. And of course we didn't, we had a bunch of open source stuff. And so they were like, wait, what, what's going on here? We're not, we can't, we can't do this. Um, and so there were very, very long discussions with, you know, both technical people and lawyers about the state of our code and the amount of open source that we had used. I, I don't know, but I think this was certainly one of the first acquisitions that they had done with this much, um, you know, open source. And it was a, it was a bit of a struggle. We had actually four products when they acquired us and, and one of them we just couldn't fix in their opinion. Like the, the risk with the open source was the components that we were using was just too high. Um, and so they, uh, so we ended up like losing a, a product. Um, and so over the next 10 years, of course, Microsoft has, you know, done, done numerous things and, and really educated themselves and, and become an industry leader around open source. Um, but it, those early days were, were a bit of a culture shock for us. Um, but, uh, but no, it's been neat. Like I, uh, I ended up on, uh, on the team that ended up doing the GitHub acquisition, for example. Um, so to, to, to be part of that team where we started out with no open source, like no, like just idea of how to, how to even ship something that used open source to su suddenly becoming a contributor to open source to then, um, being, you know, the company that, that is building visual studio code, the company that, um, that acquired GitHub, uh, is it, it's been, it's been quite a ride. Yeah. It's a particularly important to, to pay attention to the, those licenses, right? Oh, it is. That's why I always put MIT on all my stuff. They don't have I'm to deal with it, neither does anybody else. That's right. <laughs> Uh, one of the projects I work for has an interesting license. It's um, so libgit2. You mentioned at the at the start of the show, libgit2. Uh, its genesis was Git itself, and Git has a GPL license. Libgit2 wants to be used in applications, so it's got a linking exception. So it's basically, if you change libgit2, you have to, you know, I'm, I'll summarize, and I'm not a lawyer, but you have to contribute the changes that you've made. The, mm -hmm. the modified version of libgit2, but it doesn't infect the rest of your program like a, like lib, like the GPL would mm -hmm. itself. So, mm -hmm. um, but other than that one, I, I also use MIT for the most part. So what are you working on these days then? I, uh, so, I'm, I'm, I've got a dirty confession to make. I'm not a developer anymore. I, uh, at least not <laughs> for my day job. I, um, about, oh boy, about three years ago, I guess, maybe let's call it three. Uh, I actually moved over into a, a product role. So, um, right now I am the product manager for NPM. So, uh, GitHub just acquired uh, NPM. So if you're a JavaScript developer, I'm sure you're familiar with NPM. It's where JavaScript packages live. Um, and we, we decided that, that NPM made a lot of sense with GitHub. They, they, you know, they're both really focused on open source communities. They're both really focused on distribution of, um, of, of software and enabling you to distribute your software. Um, so in source code form, on GitHub and then in package form on NPM. Uh, so we acquired that and then I moved over as the uh, as the product manager for NPM when we did that acquisition. So that's what I'm working on now. Um, it's been it's been fascinating. I've learned so much because uh, I don't actually come from the Node development area. Most of the you know I've I've written C and Java and .NET, but I've written very little JavaScript in my career. And so it's been a real learning experience to get to know the community, to understand what it is that they, that they want out of NPM, what it is that we can, we can help them with. Um, and that's been really cool. Uh, 
and so that's been it's only been since April. So I'm I'm super new to this still and 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 still learning a lot. Uh, before that, I was doing product management on GitHub Actions, which is GitHub's new CI/CD system. Well, let's talk about GitHub Actions for a little bit. What are GitHub Actions for those that may not be fully aware? Yeah. Uh, so GitHub Actions is. GitHub's answer to CI CD and being GitHub, we had to do it just a little bit differently. It's it's more than just uh, a, a build and, and deployment system. It actually started out um, as a way to automate common tasks in your GitHub repository. So if I if I rewind, when we announced GitHub Actions, um, what we what we looked at it as was a way to to take GitHub apps. So you've always been able to build tooling on top of GitHub. If you want to extend GitHub to do something yourself, you can build what's called an app. Um, and that's just something that subscribes to webhooks on GitHub. So maybe you're notified when somebody comments on an issue. Um, and then your app does some work. And then, you know, perhaps it doesn't have to, but, you know, calls back into GitHub, um, talking to our REST API to, to, to do some work. So you can imagine, like every time a new issue gets created, you might have an app that listens for a webhook um, uh, and adds a label to that issue, just uh, as an example. So this is something that we've supported for years and years, and it's it's generally, you know, a, a pretty good solution to these problems, except that you've got to figure out how to host your apps yourself, and that's not something that everybody wants to do. And so the the idea behind GitHub Actions, it's it's very first version uh, was that we would provide the compute for you. So you could just describe a workflow that you want to run when something happens and we'll run it for you on our hardware. And um, I, I think that it worked out pretty well, except that the first thing that people thought of was, well, actually what, what I want to do is when somebody opens a pull request uh, or pushes something into a, a branch, what I want to do is I want to run a build. And if your build consisted of, I don't know, taking some TypeScript and turning it into JavaScript, that was probably no problem because we we gave you Docker containers and they weren't super powerful, but they were probably powerful enough for that. But if you wanted to do something like take a bunch of Objective-C and compile it into an iOS application, you were out of luck because you've got to run iOS builds on a Mac. It's like part of the, the Apple um, contract, uh, the, the, the terms and conditions. And so really quickly, people let us know that Actions was a pretty neat idea, but it wasn't really fulfilling everything that they, that they really wanted. So we kind of went back to the drawing board a little bit um, while we were still in the beta and um, basically brought virtual machines to the party. So we, we changed it around a little bit um, to really flesh out that build and release experience that people expected um, when they saw it. Um, and, you know, that, that's one of the great things about betas. You get to, you get to sort these things out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so we did. So now GitHub Actions is, um, is really a CI CD platform as well. So we've still got all that, that sort of, um, repository automation functionality. So you can run a GitHub Actions workflow whenever an issue gets commented on, whenever somebody creates uh, a release in your repository. But you can also um, run them when a pull request is created and when a, um, when somebody pushes something into master. And so then uh, you can actually run on a real virtual machine. So we've got Windows, we've got Mac, we've got Linux virtual machines that you can actually run run builds on. And so Actions, I think that's the really cool thing about Actions. It's it's unique in the build, you know, build automation space. So um, I've only had really one interaction with GitHub Actions. Uh, my latest little uh, kind of toy projects that I'm working on, I decided to go ahead and get that set up. And setting it up felt almost exactly like um, setting up uh, Azure DevOps. But hearing you talk about it, it, it makes it sound like it's not, it's not based off of or utilizing that technology. Are they, are they completely separate or are they linked in any way? They're not, they're not completely separate. So <laughs> it turns out that some of the team that built uh, Azure Pipelines 
also uh, sort of refit um, GitHub Actions into the CI CD space. Uh, so there, there are a lot of similarities, certainly conceptual uh, similarities, but um, you know, Azure Pipelines was really built to just be that one thing. And so you will see some, some differences for, let me give you just a, um, the first example that pops to mind. Uh, when you're building out a GitHub Actions workflow, if you want to do a build, the first step you have to do is you, you have to explicitly say, go check my repository out. Um, and that that's not something you have to do in in uh, Azure pipelines or in Travis or in app Bear or anything like that, because it's it's obvious, right? Your your goal in those in systems is to download that code, download that repository and build it. But in GitHub Actions, that's not the only thing that, that you might want to do. Um, you know, I don't want to clone my repository if I'm just going to tag uh, issues because that takes, it's actually really quick, but, <laughs> but you know, it's a couple seconds that I didn't need to spend, maybe even 10 if it's a really big repository, 15. But um, yeah, there, there are definitely conceptual similarities. I, 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 I like to think of, um, I, li I like to think of GitHub Actions as sort of, very much inspired by Azure DevOps, but not, it's not just like a white label on top of it, for instance. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like at, at the very least, it's a combination of Azure pipelines and notifications and maybe even some Azure functions in there some, somewhere, somehow, or, or just an eventing system, uh, so to speak, because it sounds like a, a lot of the actions can and are triggered by some type of event. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's 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 a couple of ideas kind of mixed up, but I, I actually think it um, it works really well. I like th that could be a criticism. I think it, that's its strength. Yeah, in in among those that that maybe might take it as a criticism, it sounds like there there might be existing companies or companies that have uh, their their own uh, workflows already configured and set up using something like Azure pipelines or, or Travis CI or, or whatever Jenkins and, and, and uh, octopus deploy, maybe even in, in that mix. So why would, uh, one use, uh, GitHub actions over any other of these technologies? So I, I think that's a really good question. I am, I am really hesitant to change things that are working. So if you're, you know, if you've got an octopus deploy deployment strategy set up and you're happy with it, you know, I, I, that's that, that stuff takes time to set up. There's all sorts of institutional knowledge baked into that, that, you know, I don't think that you should just like throw away on a whim for the new shiny. Um, but I think that if you're, you know, if you're looking at a new, workflow. I, I actually think GitHub Actions makes a lot of sense if you're in if you're developing in GitHub. And you know, I, I hope you are, but I realize not everybody is. GitHub Actions probably makes no sense for you if you are using, I don't know, a mercurial uh, uh, repository that's hosted in Bitbucket. I'll you know, I'll just go ahead and say that. Um, but I think GitHub Actions makes a lot of sense if you have your code in GitHub. Um, I think that you get, first of all, that um, that ability to trigger on anything that happens in your repository, because all of a sudden you start thinking of automations that you can do. At least I, I do, and I realized I might be a little biased, but I every time I'm playing within my repository, I, I I'm like, wow, it would be really cool if when I did this, I could automatically have this happen. Um, and so I think that there's opportunities to. Um, to start automating those those workflows, but uh, I just like having my my automation right where my code is on the platform that I'm always using. Um, I don't have another login that I have to make. I'm I, I get deep integration um, between my code and my builds and other parts of GitHub. Um, let me give you a concrete example. Um, GitHub Actions is really well tied into GitHub packages. So um, when I when I start a build in GitHub Actions, I get a what's called a, a GitHub token. Um, and this is something that I can use to authenticate back to my repository, um, you know, for the lifetime of that build. And it's not like very, 
it's not long term and it's not particularly privileged, but what it allows me to do is things like upload a package to GitHub packages. So my workflow could, every time somebody checks something into my main branch, I could run a build, I could package it up, maybe it's a Ruby gem, maybe it's NPM, um, and then I could upload that package right to um, GitHub packages. And I don't need to do any you know, complicated authentication, I don't need to set up any secrets or anything. It's all just nicely integrated. And so I, I think, and you know, that's just one example. I, I, I think that we'll see a lot more integrations between GitHub apps, um, like actions and like packages as time goes on. So yeah, on, and, the, and, well, okay. on, on the flip side of, of why you, you might use it, is there anything that you feel like it is missing that could prevent somebody from using it? So the, yes, honestly, the <laughs> deployment uh, story is good. Like I, I do deployments with GitHub Actions. Um, it is still missing a couple of of things that I would that I might want to really uh, uh, like Excel, like environments, for example. Um, I I like a, a deployment system that that actually knows environments, um, and that's something that. Uh, the team is working on right now. I'm, I, I've, I've been seeing some mockups. I'm, I'm, I still get to uh, cruise through their repositories and see the issues. So I'm, I'm really excited about what they're working on. But um, you know, I, I'm actually really happy with the way that I do. You know, the, our team uses it for for deployments, and we deploy to you know staging, and then we deploy to um, production. I just want, I just want a little more about in the UI. And so I think that that's going to be really exciting when it lands. Yeah, and, and with the, the GitHub acquisition, it seems like a lot of the uh, development team has moved from, uh, from uh, Azure DevOps into working on GitHub or, or working with GitHub, at least, in developing those stories. Um, you know, I, I've been in the industry 20 plus years and, and in, in recent years was mainly TFS with TFEC and then um, then, okay, well, people are starting to, to move into Git and, and in TFS. Okay, we're in Git and TFS, and now TFS has been renamed to Azure DevOps. Uh, and, and now it seems like with the acquisition, more focus is being put on GitHub and the technologies there is without getting into any NDA territory, is that the path forward for those of us with a history with Azure DevOps? Or is it just those that are get using utilizing github now get the um the the tools and technologies that existed in azure devops and uh kind of giving those to the world i think that's a good way to look at it i so you know first of all i don't think azure devops is going to go anywhere it's um you know it it, it has long-term support contracts so it's not like it could just be disappeared tomorrow um but uh, you know, there, I, I, there are definitely still teams working on it, people working on it. Um, I just saw an exciting uh, announcement that um, that they have ARM64 builders in Azure Pipelines. So they're they're definitely like that's not a trivial thing to spin up a bunch of ARM builds in a data center. Um, so uh, they're they're definitely still doing cool stuff over there. Um, I think that. We, we've gotten a little closer organizationally between the Azure DevOps team and GitHub. And I think that that does allow um, for, more, for more mixing of ideas and mixing of culture. Um, I think that's the thing that I'm most excited about because there is a ton of, of, of knowledge on both sides. Um, the, uh, the Microsoft team uh, was working on some some improvements to Git to allow it to grow to handle things like the Windows repository, which is like an insanely large, you know, hundreds of gigabytes, which sounds way too big to be true, but it is um, uh, code base. And uh, so, and similarly, GitHub has people working on on Git itself. Um, and, and so now that these two teams are able to communicate better, and work more closely together, they're going to be able to do cooler things, in my opinion. I'm really excited to see what uh, what's going to come out of that. So, um, I think that 
you know, I, I, I think that both products will will make a lot of sense. I'm excited about the the ideas that we can come up with together because right? it's two really talented teams coming together. So, so with the automation uh, available with GitHub Actions, you know, we're we're looking to automate any of the tedious, the mundane, the error prone uh, actions that that would you know, come into play. How how does one get started with GitHub Actions? Is it just I have a repo in GitHub and click on a few buttons and and go? I, I hope so. Um, that's that's the way I like to think about it. The if you have a repo in GitHub, you'll have a tab at the top that says Actions. The first time you click that, if you don't have any, if, if you don't have any workflows set up in your repository, um, you'll go to a page uh, that that gives you a selection of some samples, um, and these are actually community contributed. You know, we at GitHub we generated the first you know dozen, and and now we're getting uh, pull requests into a repository. So, um, so these are actually like the best, uh, you know, it, the Ruby team, for example, has worked on the Ruby starter workflow. So we know it's good. It's, it's, it, they've grown it. It's, it's really impressive. Um, and, uh, you know, GitHub will look at, look at your repository, try to figure out what kind of code you have in it. Um, there's a tool at GitHub that we use internally called Linguist that does this. Um, if you've ever looked at your, your GitHub repository. It used to be at the, a bar at the top. Um, of, it was kind of a color coded bar, and not a lot of people really knew what it was unless you clicked on it, and it would and then it would like pop down and tell you. We actually moved it just recently over to the uh, to the side, over to the right side. Um, and anyway, so we can we know what kind of repository you have. You know, if if you've got seventy five percent of the the files in your repository are, are our JavaScript, then we're, what GitHub Actions will do is suggest to you the Node um, workflow, and you know so that, and it's pretty straightforward. It'll run npm install, and then it'll run npm build, and it'll run npm test, and and that's most of what you need to get started with uh, uh, a pull request validation build. You know, it'll it'll just make sure everything builds and everything te uh, passes. Um, we've got some more advanced ones in there, like packaging up um, an npm package and then uploading it to npm or to GitHub packages. And there's some uh, deployment workflows. We've worked with uh, AWS and Google and Azure to build out starter workflows for getting things deployed into those into those clouds. Um, so, yes, I, I hope that it's as easy as just a couple of clicks, uh, at least for getting started, um, and then you can kind of build from there and, and grow your workflows. What about for, for companies that may not be in, in the cloud yet, other than using GitHub for source, for source control? Yeah, so um, what we've got, we've got the ability to run your builds or your run your workflows uh, on an on-premises runner that you host, you know, and you could put it in of course, you could put it in the cloud, but I think that this speaks more to what you're saying. So you could run this inside your data center, um, and it will basically um, pull for, it'll listen for GitHub Actions runs, um, and it'll pull down the workflow, and then it'll run it within your data center. So you could do that deploy locally. That's nice. Um, what about uh, potential security concerns for some of those uh, default uh, GitHub action setups or maybe a, a setup that I found online somewhere? I know the, the YAML itself is not uh, immediately readable unless you kind of understand what's supposed to be happening. So is there, is there any security issues with, with the, the actions that somebody might encounter? Sure. I mean, I think that I think that there's a couple of things. I, you know, if you are on the if you're on the internet and somebody tells you to hey run this code, um, I th I <laughs> think there. <laughs> yeah, I I think you should um, you know give some thought to to where you're reading this. You know, something like Stack Overflow, people tend to 
upvote the things that are useful and flag the things that are are really dangerous. Um, so you know, I think that that's a, a a great resource. I think that you know something that is a little less trustworthy looking, maybe you should uh, maybe you should consider. I do agree that the the YAML is. Um, you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea, um, but uh, there. You know, this is your source code. There, there, there are risks, and so I think that you should be aware of that. The, on the whole, we haven't seen um, too many bad actors in the GitHub Action space, which I'm very heartened by. But there are, of course, always risks. Um, just like you know, if somebody tells you to to sudo run this command you, you should evaluate what it is that who it is that is telling you this and what it is that they they really might want okay so if you're running a a, a project and somebody submits a pull request and you see a change to one of the yaml files just make sure that you really know what's going on there before you merge that in yeah i would the the so the nice thing about the uh, the this is that so I mentioned the GitHub token earlier, and and so we do actually have some. We have different levels of of privileges based on where an action uh, is running and when a workflow gets started. So if somebody does submit a pull request that changes the YAML, um, you know, one thing that they can't do is just like exfiltrate your secrets um, because they don't have right access to the repository. Things running. Um, on a pull request, uh, don't get access to secrets. They get, uh, they still get a GitHub token so that they can work with the repository, but it's a read-only version. Um, so there are uh, a number of steps that that we take to try to, um, to 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 make sure that things stay nice and secure. Um, but it's true. You, your your point is excellent. Uh, once you merge that YAML change, um, you have in fact. <laughs> you know, opened the door a little bit. Um, the the thing that that jumps out to me though is that I very rarely had a new contributor to a project jump in and, and say, "I'd like to work on your build system." Um, it turns out <laughs> that build systems are often not the most glamorous thing, um, and I'm not saying it's impossible. For example, somebody might want to add support for another platform, and and they might want a CI build for that. Um, but it, it's not something that I've ever encountered. In fact, trying to get people to work on the build system is usually the hard part. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. So with that, are, have we missed anything? Are there any other things to be aware of? Or, or do we want to jump into resources that you might recommend for those looking to get started? Uh, we can jump into, uh, we can jump into resources. I think that, I think that's a great idea. Okay, so so where do we where do we get started with GitHub Actions? So, um, the, what I do is not what you should do. What I do is I just kind of jump in and start playing. That's how I learn technologies. I that that's not much of a resource. But you know, like if you have a, a, a GitHub repository and you want to start playing around with Actions, you can just run one of those starter workflows and um, and start playing around with that. Uh, the GitHub's action, the GitHub Actions docs, I think, are really good. They're um, they're on our new documentation platform. We just we just launched some changes to the docs platform at, at GitHub that are really cool. We've unified some things. We've got some more really cool stuff coming. Um, I've done a number of talks at this point uh, about uh, GitHub Actions, um, and so I. I kind of walk you through the getting started and how it works. Um, and in fact, building actions themselves, which are re which is where GitHub Actions gets its name. They're the reusable components that um, that you can use um, within your, you know, so different companies offer different actions that you can use within your workflow. Um, and so um, I actually just did one. I have a, I have a, a Git user group here in London um, it's now online, uh, so you can check out the recording of of uh, of that. Um, and yeah, I think I I think that there are some great resources. Okay, we'll be sure to include all those in the show notes. Great. All right. Uh, 
Is there any advice that you might give to um, somebody who's just getting started or somebody who's maybe been in the industry for a while and, and gone stagnant, but now they want to jump back in and really kind of get their career going again? So, yes, what I do is um, I, I, I always have side projects. And now this is, I concede, you know, a, a really... Uh, something that I have spare time for. Like if I had kids, for example, um, if I had young kids, if I had uh, somebody that needed extra care at home, um, this might legitimately not be an option. I'm very privileged, so, but I, I do have side projects and that that's what allows me to actually keep writing code even though I'm a product manager um, and keeps me plugged into the development space. Um, so I, I, I have side projects and most of them are open source projects. There are always open source projects uh, looking for contributors. Um, you know, I've got one, it's called libgit2. I, I would love more contributors and I would be happy to um, actually work with somebody who uh, wanted to sort of level up their um, their contributions in as much time as you know I I can, um, but I think a lot of open source projects are looking for contributors and willing to mentor people. Um, so if you're getting started, I think that that's a a really good opportunity. Again, if you if you have the time, and I realize that not that not everybody does, but um, you know if you're looking for that sort of uh, you know level up, I guess. I think that that's a really good opportunity, especially something in a different language or a different platform than what you're used to. I mean, first of all, that makes it feel less like work. Um, you know, if you're just if you're writing a bunch of .NET code, .NET UI code all day, and you're like, I'm going to write a bunch of .NET UI code at night, it starts to feel like the same sort of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but if all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to learn Objective C and build a um, an iOS application or Swift then all of a sudden it, it might feel more fun. At least it does for me. I spent the weekend learning Rust um, it, or not. I spent the weekend <laughs> beginning to learn Rust. It's a, it's a bigger language and a bigger platform than I expected. It's got a lot of package stuff that you got to pull down like right at the beginning. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. And then the borrow model, I'm, I'm still, I'm still trying to get my head around it as a C programmer. I, I was, I thought it would be a lot more like C. It is in fact not, which no. <laughs> is kind of cool. All right. And what about, um, social media? If anybody did want to reach out to you, um, to, uh, maybe ask questions about, I guess NPM or GitHub Actions or even uh, possibly contributing to uh, LibGit too. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm E Thompson. That's E T H O M S O N. So Thompson without a P. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Edward. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. That was Edward Thompson. Edward is a developer tools nerd maintainer of libgit2, the Git library, host of All Things Git, the podcast about Git, and curator of Developer Tools Weekly. If you like this episode, please like, rate, and review on iTunes. Find show notes, blog posts, and more at sixfiguredev.com. And catch us live each week on Twitch, and be sure to follow us on Twitter at Six Figure Dev. This has been another episode of the Six Figure Developer Podcast, helping others reach their potential. I am John Calloway. And I'm Clayton Hunt.